Now what's this about the Medicaid bomb? Well, we have found that there's, not only here in Northeast Ohio, but across the country, a lot of planners out there uh, advertising and promoting about this, you know, doing VA planning. And as Paul said, you can rearrange your estate and, you know, give away assets to qualify for the VA benefits, and, you know, the very next day. Well, the problem with that is they don't take into account what happens if your health deteriorates and you have to go into a nursing home and then have to apply for Medicaid, say a year later or something like that. Well, by doing poor VA planning, what that does, it makes you ineligible for Medicaid benefits for a certain period of time. You might be ineligible for Medicaid for a couple of years, and you need it. And when that happens, the case blows up in your face. That's why we call it the Medicaid bomb. So the way that this is fixed is you, there's a way to do, you coordinate those two programs, the VA and the Medicaid program. There are, there are ways to do that so that in the event that VA planning is not enough, we can get you into Medicaid. What is Medicaid? That's what I'm going to talk about now. Paul talked about the VA, now I'm going to talk about Medicaid. Well, first of all, let's talk about what it's not. It's not Medicare. Medicare is the health insurance program for folks in this country over the age of 65. Okay. By the way, the two biggest myths that Paul and I hear all the time are, number one, I don't have to worry about losing my assets to a nursing home because Medicare will take care of those costs. Well, we dispel those myths right away on, their, on our elder care journey slide. The other big myth, by the way, that we hear is I don't need to worry about losing my assets because I've got them in a revocable living trust. Revocable living trust. Now, Paul's going to talk about them in more detail here in a little bit. I'll let you know. They don't do anything to protect your assets from a nursing home. They're a great probate avoidance tool but they don't do anything to protect your assets. So that's a big myth out there. Okay, Medicaid. Medicaid's a federal program, provides assistance for nursing home costs and some other costs too. And uh, it's a federal program that's administered by the states. And it varies a little bit state to state and sometimes even county to county. And it definitely varies single person versus a married person. So here on the screen, we've got a single person. Exempt assets are on the left. In other words, that single person's in a nursing home. What of their assets are exempt, that, meaning they, they don't count, they're not countable? Well, his house is exempt, but only for a period of 13 months. His car is exempt only up to a value of $4,500. His funeral, if he's prepaid his funeral, that's exempt. In other words, he doesn't have to go and cash out the funeral and spend that money on the nursing home. Some life insurance is exempt. Now the key word there is some. Anybody know how much some is? I had somebody last week. No, for the it's kind of like Paul's question on the jar popper there. Uh, you know, we had somebody today, our second person know what the jar popper was. I have one person knew the answer. It was last week. The amount is fifteen hundred dollars of face value. So that defeats a lot of people's plans. We've had people that will, they have the philosophy of, well, yeah, you know, I might lose all my assets if I go in a nursing home, but back here in my hip pocket, I've got this big life insurance policy that, you know, hey, when I pass away, at least my wife or my husband or my kids will get this big life insurance benefit. Well, when you have to spend down that cash value, that really defeats that purpose. Household goods are exempt. Those are things in the house, like furniture, clothes, you know, his bowling ball, his golf clubs, he doesn't have to sell any of those things. He's allowed to keep that. Countable assets are basically everything else. That would be the financial assets. Mutual funds, brokerage accounts, IRAs, annuities, uh, savings bonds, savings accounts, CDs, checking accounts, things like that. Those all have to be spent down. Now, in our example here, we've got John Jones. Let's say he's got $100,000 in those financial assets and he lives in Ohio. Well, in Ohio, he has to spend those down to $1,500 before Medicaid would then kick in and begin paying. Now, one of the th things I like to say is that if you don't have a plan in place, an asset protection plan or a long-term care plan, the state that you live in has a plan for you. And this is the state's plan. So we're going to assume that John Jones was part of that uninformed crowd. He didn't have a plan in place, so he gets Ohio's plan for a single person, and this is it. Now, what's the problem with that plan? 
He loses everything. That's exactly right. He loses $98,500 in order to qualify for Medicaid. How does it work for a married couple? Well, it's a little bit different. We've got John and Agnes with $300,000 in financial assets. That's not counting their house. <clears throat> We're going to say John is the, uh, the institutionalized spouse, the one going into a nursing home or in a nursing home. Agnes is the community spouse or the healthy spouse. Well, and they live in Ohio. We're going to assume they're part of the uninformed group, and therefore they don't have a plan, which means they get Ohio's plan. Here's how Ohio's plan works. Out of the 300000 she's allowed, Agnes, the community spouse, is allowed to keep 109560 The remaining amount is what's known as the spend-down amount, and that has to be spent down to $1,500, and then Medicaid would kick in. Well, what's the problem with that? Again, it costs them a lot of money. It basically costs them two-thirds of their financial estate in order to qualify for Medicaid. Now, before I go any further, I mentioned earlier about we're here to inform you, and I don't want anybody walking out of here with a misconception. You know, there might be a couple sitting here tonight that you've got $110,000 in the bank, and that's all you have. And you heard me just say that the healthy spouse is allowed to keep $109,560. And you might be thinking, oh, we're pretty good shape. You know, we can keep most of our assets if one of us goes into a nursing home. That's not the way it works in that case. In that case, it gets assigned 50% to each side. So 55,000 here and 55,000 for the community spouse. So the way the formula is, is that the community spouse is allowed to keep 109,560 or 50%, whichever is less. That's how that works. Now there's some other things that are happening behind the scenes. A lot of people are not informed about. For example, the income situation. We just talked about assets, but what about income? Well, let's say his income's 1900 and her income's 500. So together they make $2400 a month in retirement. And that is a very common figure we see here in Northeast Ohio. Let's say they spend this down to the 1500, Medicaid's paying. Well, Medicaid has another rule. They'll say, "All right, John, uh, we'll pay for your nursing home costs." But any monies that are coming in your name, any checks coming in your name, let's say your Social Security check, your, your pension, that has to go to the nursing home. Well, if that happens, that leaves Agnes with only $500 a month to live off of. Anybody think Agnes can live off of $500 a month? Absolutely not. She can't. And Medicaid knows that too. <clears throat> so they've got a rule. It's called the MIMNA, the Minimum Monthly Maintenance Needs Allowance. You don't need to know what that stands for. Remember that. It's just a rule that says in a scenario like that, um, Agnes would be allowed to get $1,821 a month. Now, don't think that Medicaid has given her an extra $1,321 a month. They're not. They're taking it out of John's income. So they're basically shifting it from the right pocket to their left pocket is what's happening. But nevertheless, that's still better for Agnes, you know, getting... Uh, Eighteen twenty-one a month versus five hundred a month, but she's still short approximately six hundred dollars a month from what she was used to getting. So how does she make up that shortfall? Well, let's say she's in her mid eighties; she can't go back to work. The only money she's got left is this, what's called her resource allowance. So she has to start dipping into that and spending that down. Does anybody think that's a good recipe for Agnes? No, not really. That's a recipe for disaster. But these are the kind of things that happen and things that happen behind the scenes that most people don't know about. Another thing that we see quite often is that well-meaning family members, friends of the family, neighbors, they give advice. They want to help John and Agnes. Again, John's in the nursing home. So maybe the neighbor, Agnes's na uh, neighbor Pete, maybe Pete's a plumber. And he's given her some advice on what she needs to do. Not on plumbing, but on this. Maybe he says, well, Agnes, you need to spend that money down on the nursing home. Or, you know, go buy some funerals. I heard you could buy some funerals with that money. And, you know, that's okay. Or you go buy a new car, Agnes, or fix up your house or pay off some bills. Well, Pete the plumber, actually, that advice that he gave to her, there's nothing wrong with that advice. She can actually do all those things as part of the spend down. But what's the problem with that? Again, this is the difference between the informed versus the uninformed. Put yourself in Agnes's shoes for just a moment, all of you. Do you think Agnes really wants to spend this money here? What does she really want to do? What's your first name? Don? 
Very good. She said it real quietly, too. But she's right. She wants to keep it, Don said. And that's exactly right. So what if? What if there's a strategy out there? And there is. I'm going to give it to you now. Now, this isn't the silver bullet or the magic solution that works in every case. Every case is unique. That's one of the things I like about this field of planning is every, every case is unique. But we're going to assume that John and Agnes are now part of the informed crowd, and they did some planning ahead of time. As a matter of fact, they got their documents, uh, their, their ducks in a row, so to speak, and they got their legal documents in order. Uh, Paul's going to come back up and talk about legal documents here in a little bit. But we're going to assume that they have a very important legal document that has certain wording in it, uh, maybe Medicaid-friendly wording, as we call it, that would allow them to execute this strategy. So John's in the nursing home. Let's say Agnes then takes this money and then gifts it over to herself. And then she uses that money to purchase uh, a specialized Medicaid-compliant product that would pay her an income stream over her life expectancy, which is 10 years. It's going to pay her $1,587 a month for 10 years. What does that do? Well, what this strategy does is effectively a couple of things. Number one, it protects the entire estate. She's allowed to keep that. She's taking the rest of this money and taking it and putting it into an income stream that's paying back to her. So it preserves that money. She doesn't have to use that money to pay for the nursing home. It would then get her down to the spend down amount over here, which then Medicaid would begin paying. The other thing that it does is remember that income shortfall that Agnes had of about $600 a month? Well, now she's got $1,587 a month coming in, so she doesn't have that income shortfall anymore, and she doesn't have that problem to deal with. So this is a very good solution for Agnes. And the point in going over this isn't to say that, again, this, is, this isn't saying that, hey, this is what you should do in every single case. It's not. Our point in going over this is to let you know here's a situation, a problem, but for some people that did a little bit of planning ahead of time, that there was a solution out there. They didn't know about it at the time, but they sought proper counsel, they got informed about it, and there's a solution out there to help them protect their assets. So you're going to hear Paul and I talk about, you know, certain situations that, you know, maybe might de be depressing and you think, oh, geez, you know, that just sounds terrible. The good news is whether you're here tonight, maybe you're here because your mom or dad or your wife or your husband is about to go into a nursing home, or maybe they're already in one or in assisted living. We call that a crisis case. Even if it's that type of a situation, there's a real good possibility that there are things that can be done to help protect assets. On the other hand, probably the majority of you are here tonight because you're what we call pre-planning. You want to find out what can we do right now to protect our assets and in case this ever happens down the road. And that's an even better situation because you've got more time to plan and prepare. This area of planning, Medicaid planning, long-term care planning, whatever you want to call it, it used to be a lot more straightforward, but it all changed with the passage of the DRA, the Deficit Reduction Act. Went into effect February 8th of 06. Made some big-time changes. To put this into a time frame for everybody, you guys all remember Vice President Cheney, right? Well, remember when he went on that hunting trip with his buddy? You guys remember what he did to his buddy? He shot him. Shot him right there in the backside is where he got him. And uh, literally, he was the butt of many jokes, Vice President Cheney, you know, on Letterman and Jay Leno, so uh, the uh, White House, they wanted to get him out of the country. He went down to Africa on another hunting trip, by the way. Meanwhile, back in D.C., the Senate was voting on this DRA, and they were deadlocked 50-50. So think back to your high school political science class. Who cast the deciding vote when the Senate's deadlocked? The Vice President. So they had to whisking back up to D.C., and he came in and cast the deciding vote that sent this into law. So what are some of the changes with this new law? Big changes with look-back period and gifting. Let's go over gifting or asset transfers. We get a lot of questions about that. And it's not that you can't gift. You can. But as we like to say, there's right ways to gift, and there's wrong ways to give. You might want to say informed versus uninformed, that type of thing. How did it work under the old rules? Gifting, I'm talking about. Well, under the old rules, let me give, yeah, we've got a case study here. We've got a gift of 50000 Let's say it's grandma, 
Grandma had one daughter who is deceased, and that daughter had a daughter. So we've got grandma, and we've got her granddaughter. Now, the granddaughter wants to go to medical school, and grandma wants to give her a gift of $50,000. Grandma doesn't have a whole, much, a whole lot of money. That's pretty much all of her money. But she wants to help her granddaughter go to medical school, so she gives her that money. Well, unbeknownst to grandma, the state that she lives in has what's called a gift divisor. Now, it says $5,000 on the screen there. In Ohio, it's a different number. We're just using that to keep our math simple. But you simply take the gift, divide it by the divisor. The answer is 10 or 10 months. In other words, that creates a 10-month penalty period. Now, these are the old rules. So let's say under the old rules, grandma makes that gift on January 1st of the year 2000. Let's say 10 months goes by. So it's now October 1st of the year 2000. And let's say the next day, October 2nd, grandma suffers a stroke and has to go into a nursing home. Well, under the old rules, it, the uh, penalty period, the 10 months, started from the date of the gift. So once she got past that 10 months, she was free and clear. In other words, the next day, October 2nd, she went into a nursing home. She was eligible for Medicaid, even though she made this big gift to her granddaughter. But fast forward now to the new rules under the DRA. We're going to use the same numbers. They still apply. The, those still work the same way. You still have a 10-month penalty period. But under the new rules, a couple things that have changed. Number one, it used to be a look-back period of three years. The new rules now say the look-back period on gifting is, anybody know? Five, somebody in the back said five years. That's exactly right. The other thing, see everyone, I shouldn't say everyone knows, it. a lot of people know about that one. What people don't know, and this is just as big, is how they apply the gift. Let's say grandma makes that gift on January 1st of 2010. Let's say 10 months goes by. As a matter of fact, four years goes by. So it's now January 1st of 2014. There's still a 10-month penalty period, but four years has gone by. And now grandma suffers that stroke and has to go into a nursing home. The granddaughter goes down to Medicaid, figures she can apply, get grandma on Medicaid. Well, they're going to ask her, did grandma make any gifts over the last five years? The granddaughter says yes. She gives them the details. And they say, okay, it's a 10-month penalty period. But now that penalty period, instead of starting on the date of the gift, it now starts when grandma's in the nursing home and is down to her 1500 In other words, she doesn't have any money. So now grandma, even though she has no money, She's now ineligible for any Medicaid benefits for the next 10 months. Now, does anybody here know of a nursing home that's going to keep grandma for 10 months for free? He said, mm, mm And you know what? He's right. I haven't found one, and that's because there isn't one. You know, nursing homes are, um, there's profit, you know, for profit, there's nonprofit. But, you know, they all need to get paid to pay their workers and provide appropriate care and so forth. A lot of people will ask, well, what's going to happen to Grandma? The answer is, I don't know. I got a real technical answer. She's screwed. <laughs> okay? You know, I mean, I guess the granddaughter drops out of school and takes care of her. I, they're just, but that's the difference between the informed and the uninformed. Now, Grandma could have done some gifting, you know, if she had sought, you know, or found out, you know, right ways to do it and so forth. But um, with these new rules, a lot of people just don't understand them and the effects that it can have. You know, like I said, the penalty period, the way that applies is one of the big changes that people are totally unaware of. The look back period, most people know how that's changed from three to five years. The bottom line on all this, this discussion over the last couple minutes with grandma, is that even innocent transfers can cause very lengthy penalty periods. In other words, was grandma trying to cheat the system or anything? No. What was grandma trying to do? She's trying to help her granddaughter go to medical school, a very noble cause, a very loving thing, you know. But unfortunately, it ended up hurting them, had some ramifications. Now, what about some other type of transfers? I'd like to talk about this one, adding a name to a real estate title, because we get a lot of questions on that. Let's say we have a lady, she just lost her husband, she's got one son. Geez, Joe, can I just add my son's name? Can I just put my house? Let's say she doesn't have a lot of money, she's got her house, and a lot of people are like that. I want to put my deed in my son's name. And that way, you know, hey, I die, and he already owns it, and, you know, it's simple and all that. Or, geez, let's say 10 years goes by, and then I go into a nursing home. The house is in my son's name. He gets to keep it. You know, again, nice and clean. The answer is yes, you can do that. But there's some ramifications in doing that that 
that, that mom, we'll call her mom, that mom didn't know about, nor did the son. What are those ramifications? Again, the informed versus the uninformed. Let's say that son's married. He's got the home in his name now, and he gets a divorce. You know, 50% of marriages in this country end in divorce. Well, that could be part of that legal proceeding then, that, you know, that house that he owns. Or what if he's just driving, let's say he doesn't get divorced, but he's driving down the road and he causes a car accident. And let's say he hits a surgeon from the Cleveland Clinic and damages his hands or his fingers, and now there's this big lawsuit. Well, any assets in his name are, you know, could be uh, at risk of loss through that lawsuit. What if he dies? What if he dies before mom? You know, he's married, let's say. Well, most married folks say, you know, hey, if I die, I want my, my stuff to go to my spouse. So then the, the, you know, the daughter-in-law ends up getting the house. And maybe mom's still living in it, and the daughter-in-law a couple years later gets remarried. And now, you know, maybe she passes away, and it goes to, some, to her new husband, and now he owns it. You know, all these types of things. And, you know, I, maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, you know what, Joe? Yeah, but my son, you know, you talk about, you know, divorce. You know, he's married to a wonderful woman, and they're never going to get divorced. And he's a heck of a good driver. He's not going to get in any accidents. And he works out. He's healthy. He eats right. He's not going to die anytime soon. So I'm not really worried about that. But here's the one thing that will trip him up because it happens to all of us. And that's death. Okay. See, unbeknownst to mom and the son, let's say mom bought that house along with her husband, dad, uh, back right after World War II for $10,000 here in Parma. Let's say it's now worth 210000 well, if mom dies and the son inherits the house through a will or a trust, something along those lines, well, he receives a step up in that basis. So when he goes to sell it, he has to pay zero capital gains taxes. And that's a good thing, right? Okay. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about she, she deeds it over to him before she dies. Well, unbeknownst to them, she also deeded that $10,000 basis over to him. So now, let's say mom passes away a few years later. He thinks, well, you know, I'm going to go sell. You know, one's living there now. I'm going to sell the house. I should get a couple hundred thousand for it. He sells it for $210,000. He didn't know that he was now responsible for that basis. So now there's a $200,000 capital gain there. Anybody know what the capital gains tax rate is? No, a little bit high. I hope it never goes that. That's the estate tax. 15%. It was scheduled to go to 20, but Congress and the president, you know, kind of extended stuff for a couple years here. So 15% of 200,000 is $30,000. Bam. Just got nailed with a tax that he wasn't expecting. Remember on our elder care journey, we talked about death and things like probate and unnecessary taxes. There's a good example of an unnecessary tax that if they had done their planning right, wouldn't have happened. Um, Paul and I had, any, uh, I mean, a real life example, a uh, lady out in Medina, uh, her mom and dad, the only difference is mom and dad didn't die. Mom and dad deeded their house to their daughter in Medina and, uh, their health just sort of deteriorated and they wanted to go move with the daughter in Medina and they had an in-law suite. So they, they ended up selling the house up here in Cleveland for mom and dad, but it was in the daughter's name. Now mom and dad were still alive, but the point of the story is, Real life example, she got hit with a $40,000 capital gains tax. Now that was this summer that we had these clients in. And I asked her, I said, did you know that that was coming? She's like, absolutely not. You know, it smacked me upside the head. I was really surprised by that. She's like, we would have never done it that way if we had known that. So again, you know, the difference between the informed and the uninformed and these ramifications that people don't know about. Okay, as I said earlier, you might be sitting here because you're in this situation right there. You're healthy. And you're here tonight because you want to find out what can you do now to protect yourselves, to protect your spouse, your retirement, your standard of living, your assets, your inheritance for the kids, any of those things. Well, we found in, that, in, in a setting like this, typically about 25% of the group is here because of a crisis right now. They have a loved one that's going in a nursing home or they're already in. Probably the other 75% is like this. Well, here's the common problem. Social Security shuffle, the straight pensions, unexpected illness, and hidden medical taxes. So let's break each one of those down. We've got Bill and Mary, age 70 and 68. Uh, Bill has a straight pension. A straight pension 
It's more common than what you would think. A straight pension means that he gets more money on a monthly basis, but when he dies, the pension dies with him. Okay, so if he dies first, the pension dies with him. So he's got a straight pension, and then Social Security at 1,200, so he's getting 3,000 a month. Mary gets 600 from Social Security. Now, ladies, pay particular attention to this. Let's say Bill dies first. What's going to happen to Mary? Well, she's going to lose the eight. And by the way, this, these three things all total $3,600 a month. I forgot to mention that. Bill dies first. She's going to lose the straight pension of $1,800. She's going to lose her Social Security check. We call it the Social Security shuffle. She's going to shuffle over and pick up Bill's check of $1,200. So now she's gone from $3,600 a month down to $1,200 a month. Now, I'm not a, you know, Paul asked earlier about any math teachers. I'm not a math teacher. But that, to me, sounds like a 67% drop in income. Anybody think Mary can get by on that? It's going to be pretty tough for her to do that in today's society. Now, if Bill was sitting right here in the front row, right where you are, sir, you know what he'd be telling me? He's like, Joe, you're forgetting something. You didn't mention about this $300,000 we saved up. You know, Joe, the way we saved that was we worked real hard. Um, we didn't take those real lavish vacations. You know, we could have. Uh, we kept our, our uh, bungalow in Parma Heights. We could have built a bigger house, you know, uh, all of our friends were, but we didn't do that. We could have been driving Cadillacs, but you know what? You know, we, we always drove used Chevys and Fords. You know, we saved our money. Does that stuff sound familiar from either you guys or your parents, perhaps? And I'd be like, well, that's great, Bill. I'm glad you did that. But what if, Bill, what if prior to your death, you have an unexpected illness that requires a nursing home stay? Well, if they're part of the uninformed crowd, if they don't have a plan, they get Ohio's plan. And with Ohio's plan, out of that 300000 how much can Mary keep? 109560 Good job. That's right. So not only upon his death would she lose two-thirds of the assets, if there was that unexpected illness, there's the potential for her to lose two-thirds of the assets too. Not a good situation. But, as I said earlier, the good news is there are solutions. A uh, possible solution here, it's called an income and inheritance trust plan. And it's just like it says. It's a combination of uh, asset protection strategies as well as legal documents combined to help protect for Mary or for Bill or for their kids, let's assume they have kids, to protect the income situation for the surviving spouse, especially for Mary, but also to protect the inheritance. So again, a combination of strategies and some legal documents, there are solutions that are out there. Uh, outright gifts to children, we've actually already covered that. Are there other steps to consider? And there are, and it has to do with the legal documents. I just mentioned about them, and I said Paul is going to be coming back up to discuss those. Before we do that, though, there was one other thing out of those four common problems that I have failed to talk about, and that has to do, it's called the hidden medical tax. It's really not a tax, but it has to do with liens. And what I'm holding here in my hands is a stack of liens that I have a staff member. Uh, she went down to Central Ohio to pull these. These are all public documents, public records, so we're not going to invade anybody's privacy here. Um, but nevertheless, we're here in Cuyahoga County, so we didn't want to pull them from Cuyahoga County. So we went down to Columbus, Ashland, Mansfield, that neck of the woods. And you might be wondering, well, what are you talking about with liens? Well, on that... A uh, yellow sheet that you saw that, you know, uh, talked about this workshop that invited you here. I believe one of the bullet points on that said, you know, find out how to protect your real estate from liens placed on it or something along those lines. Well, we're going to talk about that now. You see, when you're married and your spouse goes into a nursing home, you're allowed to, this, the healthy spouse is allowed to live in the house. So that confuses a lot of people. Well, geez, how can a lien get placed on the house? Well, let's go over that. And I'm going to have somebody, I'm going to ask somebody to help me. Um, what's your first name, sir? Harold. Harold? Do you need glasses to? Uh... Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> you? You got the glasses. Can you give me a hand here? Sure. Okay. And what's your first name? Carrie. Carrie. Okay. I'm just, you're just going to have to read a couple things. I'm going to read most of it. So we're going to go through, uh, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole stack. Don't worry. Uh, but the, the top one here, it says, Now comes the state of Ohio, Ohio Department of Job and Family Services, through outside counsel. Outside counsel. Does anybody know what that means? 
Exactly. The state hires an attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the legal counsel for the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. And then it says Gracie Jones. So we're now talking about a lady named Gracie Jones. Now, again, these are public record. I'm not invading her privacy. She's now deceased. The date of her death is March 29th of 06. She was a Medicaid recipient at the time of her death, and the claim span is July 16th, 03, through September 7th of 06. So they tell us a lot about Gracie. This is where I'm going to ask for your help here, Carrie. There exists a Medicaid claim against the estate of Gracie Jones in the sum of, can you read that number nice and loud, Carrie? $200,533.11. Okay. And then it goes on to say plus interest. Now, how can that happen? Well, I'm going to assume, because it doesn't look like Gracie has a spouse, that Gracie was part of the uninformed crowd. She was, went into a nurse home, got on Medicaid, so she was spent down to the $1,500, but she had some real estate. Maybe they couldn't sell the real estate. You know, they might have been trying to, but it's a tough market. Maybe they just couldn't sell the real estate. Well, Medicaid was, will still pay for her care once she spends down to that $1,500, but they keep a tab of that. They keep track of that. Okay, and that grows with interest, that amount. So when Gracie passes away, you know, the kids, a lot of times the kids, they don't know about this stuff. The family doesn't know about these kind of things, about liens. They might think, well, geez, all right, we're going to sell her house now. And yeah, she lost all her money, she's, you know, but at least we'll sell her house. Well, maybe the house, I don't know what the house is worth, but all I know is there's a lien against it for over $200,000. Maybe it's worth 100000 so the family ends up with nothing. Okay, one more we'll go through. And Carrie, I'll ask for your help again. Now, this one appears to be a married couple. It says, Laura Jean Hall, now deceased. The date of her death is September 17, 06. She was a Medicaid recipient at the time of her death, and the claim span is April 30th, 03, through September 13th of 06. There exists a Medicaid claim against the estate of Laura Hall in the sum of plus interest, okay? And you can follow along here too. Point number four on this one says, on December 2nd, 1994, Laura Jean Hall and Robert L. Hall Jr. executed and recorded a joint survivorship deed. Now, how many people here are married? Okay. How many of you married folks do you think you've got what's called a joint survivorship deed for your real estate? Okay, a couple of you, most, all right. Um, and some people just don't know. Um, a joint survivorship deed is a fairly common way for married folks to hold title to their real estate. So, and thanks, Carrie, for your help. How can this happen for a married couple? Joe, you just said that, you know, if, the, if Robert's the husband, if he's healthy, he can live in the house. Yeah, he can live in the house, but what's he going to do eventually? No? He's going to die. I mean, he might sell it, you're right. But we know he will die because we're all going to die, all right? So no one's living in the house then. They can place that lien on it. So it can happen to married folks too. And again, these are things that people, they're just unaware of. <clears throat> but by being informed with proper planning, perhaps that they had uh, you know, some type of uh, a trust plan set up uh, with certain legal documents, that even if there was that nursing home situation, that their assets are protected. <laughs>